Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to the last session of, the, uh, of day one of the Global Art Forum, Predicting the Present. Um, and as a, uh, as a way of introduction, the session is called uh, Sensing Prediction. And it came about, uh, in a way, through uh, a reflection that I, I had and a conversation I've been having actually with Cecil for a number of years, really, I think, since the beginning of uh, 2020, 2020 and the beginning of the pandemic, which is that um, we became phenomenally and maybe even more intimately uh, aware and self-conscious of our senses, of all of our senses uh, during COVID. Uh, indeed, of course, those of you who may have caught COVID will may have also lost your sense of taste, your sense of smell. And um, there was a, it was a kind of um, mass uh, scientific experiment of how reality would feel when um, a number of our senses are denuded and what does that tell us about um, our kind of biological being in the world? And also, of course, how that was, that was happening simultaneously to our lives being forced to exist in the two and a half dimension, mostly on screens, where, um, you know, two senses were mostly foregrounded, the sense of sight and the sense of hearing. And indeed, um, uh, you know, by having this ongoing conversation with Cicel about whether or not smell could ever be digitized, and she has a very interesting answer. Um, and so, uh, and then we fast forward to 2023, and it's very, very clear that one of the sort of mimetic, um, topics that have sort of equally crashed into our external and inter internal lives is that of artificial intelligence. I suggested uh, earlier uh, on Wednesday, actually, that even though AI has existed at the very least for 70 odd years, arguably hundreds of years, maybe even thousands, depending how you define it, um, there's a sense in which it just arrived a few weeks ago. And um, and so you know I use that as a as a backdrop to uh, introduce and contextualize uh, two of our guests today, because I believe that both uh, Refik Anadol and Cecil Tolles are kind of leading their fields, um, working across scales and contexts, um, and both are I think of them as intrepid uh, voyagers, explorers. And their explorations are um, are inherently and um, also very technically linked to um, science and technology. Um, and so we uh, we're going to explore both of their practices and how their practices may forge a, a link, a connection between things that have happened in the past things that are happening now and things that may happen in the future. And whether indeed, um, to go back to the conversation we were having with Lucia earlier, you know, whether maybe we're also hostages to those kind of terminology, and maybe that terminology is something that we need to think about again. I um, would now like to uh, welcome one of the Global Art Forum's longest uh, uh, family members, hans Ulrich Obrist. Uh, who, I mean, the standard introduction to Hans Ulrich is Hans Ulrich needs no introduction. <laughs> uh, it's like the best bio in the world, it seems to me. Um, but what um, uh, Hans Ulrich and uh, Refik, for a number of years now, have been having one of their ongoing infinite conversations. And so this is kind of the next chapter uh, in that. And uh, also, uh, Cecil has worked on a number of projects at the Serpentine, also with Lucia and with Hans Ulrich, and many different kind of initiatives that bring these worlds together. And to my knowledge, Cecil and Refik have never sat together on a stage like this. Uh, 
when, when was that? In Venice? Venice. Very, very shortly in Venice. Um, but I, as I said, I, I, I was got really super excited at what could happen when the four of us get together on stage like this. But firstly, uh, a, uh, also I need to mention that Hans Ulrich has a new book out, um, which is published by Isolari. Do you have a copy here? I'll, I'll get it from my bag in a minute. Um, which is the conversations with uh, James Lovelock, uh, and maybe we can get into that as well, Hans Ulrich. Um, and uh, also, most importantly, uh, we've decided that our combined DJ name is going to be DJ Ping Pong. Um, and so DJ Ping Pong will uh, debut next year, uh, in 2024. Um, but uh, that's an announcement that we, we would like to make here. Hans Ulrich, so please welcome Hans Ulrich Obris. Thank you. Thank you so, so much, uh, Shimon, and thank you all for being here. And of course, thanks to Cecil and, and Refik uh, for participating, for, for joining us. I want to say how extraordinary it is that this is actually the 12th, right, Global Art Forum. Uh, Shimon is organizing in such a brilliant way here in, uh, in Dubai. And I think it's fascinating, you know, the other day I spoke with Philippe Pareno about this idea that sometimes he makes a film which produces a garden, and then the garden produces a film, or sometimes he produces a building, which produces a film. Uh, in case of Schumann, actually, uh, the 12 years of Global Art Forum have produced an extraordinary novel, and in a way the novel has produced the Global Art Forum, so I think we should give Schumann a very big round of applause. And as Shimon says, we want to talk today about the relation between the past, the present, and the future uh, in the process of redefinition. And Refik's uh, amazing work, of course, uses vast data sets and AI to actually make computational works, which are familiar and uncanny. We can see one, I'm sure those of you who haven't seen it yet, we'll have time later to see it here in Dubai. It's a collaboration um, Refik has been doing with uh, Julius Baer, a collaboration also with the Serpentine and uh, actually Bettina Korek and I, Bettina Korek, the CEO of the Serpentine, who is here and I are so grateful to Julius Baer and Refik for this amazing dialogue. And of course, Sissel, in a similar way, I mean, Paul Kleban said art makes the invisible visible. And uh, that's, I think, what one of the things you both do. And Sissel, in a pioneering way, invest investigates the non-visible realm of, of, of smell, scientifically, politically, culturally, in many different ways. So I think we should give both artists another warm welcome. And I also wanted to dedicate uh, today's session, I, I mean, both Schumann and I felt that it's urgent to uh, our friend Peter Weibel, who very sadly passed away now. We cannot talk about art and technology uh, without talking about Peter Weibel, because he has been uh, a pioneering force. And, you know, we often bring in the, the experiments in art and technology in the 60s, but Peter Weibel's entire work is another of such an example. He brought together um, art and technology early on, and we spoke actually earlier to Lynn Hirschman Leeson, uh, who said, for example, uh, the legendary Lynn Hirschman Leeson, that, you know, Weibel was the very first artist who recognized her work in terms of art and technology. So I think we really need to remember Peter Weibel here, and I know that Refik will do that as well at the beginning of his speech, and maybe that's a transition, because Refik, I wanted to ask you to tell us a little bit about the extraordinary work you have created and are still creating, actually, um, for and with uh, Julius Baer, because in a way, I think it's interesting, and we'll hear more about that later from Sissel, because I think something is deeply changing in terms of the ontology of what an artwork is, and in terms of actually artworks being living organisms. Artworks, in that sense, are also no longer being finite, but in that sense, being infinite. Uh, I mean, we've been thinking about, you know, buildings like the Sagrada Familia being infinite, but that was a rather rare occasion. But today, uh, a, a very big number of actually really important artworks created today 
I in that sense, you know, infinite. The work you are creating starts with an infinite amount of data, which you make visible. It has to do with glaciers. Uh, so, Rafik, it would be great to hear a little bit about that. Yes, super, super honored to be here all together. I think the project is thanks to you, of course, that it has a different take than our other projects. Working with AI for seven years and mostly like working with big data sets was a comfort zone. And because we were able to download images, we all share our data. It's really not hard to download all this data. It's not really hard to hack your accounts. It's really like nothing hard at all, right? Just needs resources and a bunch of code. But what was amazing that this project is really make a major changes physically being there to collect data, physically feeling the project, the importance of glaciers. As we all know, the 70% of the fresh water in the world is coming from glaciers. And they are constantly changing. You cannot even step on the same glacier two times. You cannot use the same ice cave two times. It's the nature's incredible sculptures constantly changing by our reactions in the other part of the world. I mean, these living pieces are the reason we are have a fresh water, and we are unfortunately messing them up. So when I go there, our methods of like downloading data or whatever, that they have no meaning at all, because this is the last memories of the humanity, and it was a very heavy hit. I think this project is completely different than our other projects, and we spent 10 days, walk eight kilometers every day with 50 kilograms of cameras, did multiple like surveys with drones and lidars and nerves and all, whatever the update, like recent or future tools. But what was heavy to me is different than other projects is being there, again, thanks to Hans Ulrich, that incredible feedback, physically there, feeling the cold, the cold of the temperature and understanding the meaning of what we do has a completely different shift. And I really appreciate that moment of like going there with a, like a tour guide who had been helping NASA GPL team from the Eisen Space Agency. Like he showed us a point that we were sitting with our like all the gears. And he said 10 years ago, he's a 20 years of tour guide, said there was no way I can drive here. The whole the things that you see here was completely glaciers and all melted down. That was a very heavy hit. That not can be done in a comfort zone at home or like you know in hot machines or whatever cloud computing. That was a very heavy hit. I heavily advise everyone if you're interested to learn about what climate change means. There's a hard evidence, physical on Earth, that doesn't need any explanation at all. It's pure fact of a melting memories of humanity. That was a very heavy hit, honestly. But thanks for the opportunity that we are diving into this, bring attention, and make meaningful, purposeful work. And can you talk a little bit about how you actually base that on an ever-growing archive of uh, a very big number of images and uh, how you then develop it uh, with AI into the work? So uh, last seven years, we heavily focused on collective memories of humanity, never inspired by personal data, but the idea of like things hopefully belongs to humanity, like space, nature, culture, urban, things I hope that matters for humanity. And it was an interesting research because the comfort zone of AI is like we can download any data or any, any data set, but doesn't mean they represent what we want to do, right? So cleaning process, like understanding the archive or knowledge, or in that case, memory, was a really inspiring research. And over the years, what was really easy is like we find more than 3 billion images, but doesn't mean that it just finished there. Like there's a lot of work on the curating data, can be image, sound, or text. Uh, and then we just really try to craft algorithms over the years. Now generative AI is something very common and uh, popular, but seven years with AI feels like a 70 years from like early, you know, ancient GAN models, like the very recent diffuse ones, but what, like it's a beautiful like journey of how even the idea is fundamental, um, the expression is changing every moment. Probably while I'm talking, someone publishing a paper will change something else, and it's really inspiring to think like this. And you've brought some images? Yes, I have a keynote to share. If yeah, please, we'd love to see it. By the way, I'm um, oh, sorry, I just want to start with that, um, your notes from Peter Weibel. It's easy to predict the future how when you make the future. I think Peter Weibel is a hero. I was 2008 in Istanbul as an undergrad. I was fortunate to work with him very closely. And the year I coined the term data painting, he was a mentor at MFA studies. Him and Bana Serexe was really pushing all the students and they are like asking like, what is your like maximum capacity of imagination? His classes were extraordinary. And he was the only one I know that truly really believe in media arts that pushed the medium way before. And his museum at Kayam is preserving art for more than 40 years. I'm honored to be in his collection from data paintings and infinity rooms. And we were literally four days ago just get an email, and he was planning to make a show with Kraftwerk. And it's a very heavy hit that 
that really touch um, the journey. But, you know, we are all on our shoulders of many heroes, and I think remembering them is the best way to live life. And um, just want to quickly um, show the project. It's, it's a really very different project. Why I think it's, um, I mean, for people remembering our works, it all starts with, you know, downloading data. But this time, we took it in a much different take. And these are beautiful glaciers, that they are like um, in Iceland, volcanic glaciers. And the project is not only Iceland, it's just the first stop. We just came, I'm literally coming from minus 20 degrees to like, what is 30 degrees? Um, but it was a, a powerful moment to go there, we do these recordings with drones and like understand these incredible forms and shapes. Their sound is a whole different dimension. So we have like around seven terabytes of just raw recordings. Unfortunately, they are melting, they are shape shifting, like we are walking on them, the wind. Like in 10 minutes in Iceland, your weather can completely change. And you suddenly need a guide, a wisdom, someone to help you to find a way to go the other side of the mountain or glacier to survive from the storm so your camera can function. It's a really interesting take. So far, uh, these 10 days of expedition, but we get an incredible amount of data sets. And Greenland and Antarctica is the next steps, and hopefully in London we will have the grand finale. This is the UMAP studies of this archive, and this is a recent GAN algorithm that we have been training on. We, we, we already modified these neural networks to make this more high resolution, the 2K, 2K, for example, um, much higher resolution than generative models. And then uh, just to understand like what this you know, model can learn from these materials. And in Iceland, there is 269 glaciers and incredible forms. And they are like so di diverse and different. Like in one kilometer, you see something whole different types. And I found them very inspiring because, again, in other projects, we don't have this time to deep dive into the nature in this level. But spending 10 days and immersing yourself and getting cold. And this is unfortunately, this is glacier. Not anymore. Uh, you have the glaciers. Like it was a very interesting um, feeling. And I will say the project is not only stops here, and we are trying to learn about, like, for example, the, this water, this space is ice caves. I mean, we work with immersive environments, and they are like the reasons of this fresh water that we all drink as humanity. Like going these fundamentals before recording data and have the depth and discourse and context was really powerful. And I have a advice for anyone researching with AI. I know we are all in comfort zones talking with chat <laughs> GPT or mid general stable diffuse. I don't believe they have truly meaning unless you understand where data comes from. Um, and I think this is a really interesting take on the ethical issues about data, like where this, you know, in information comes from, how can we have a clarity, are we really on the piece that we create with AI, is this the answer to like many questions that rightfully many creators are asking. We just want to also find these questions, but also what is amazing, the blue tint comes from the depth of the ice, uh, ice uh, glaciers, uh, there is no red uh, spectrum over the like thousands of years, it's basically seeing these time machines when you dive in the ice caves, and ice caves are unfortunately not never the same, like next year we will go there, they got bigger or different forms because the climate change is giving a new heat form and they ev every time changing. These are the fundamentals of the artwork. Um, what I want to say today is like, um, again, thanks to this project, it's a great to be go uncomfortable zones and change the behaviors. And I think AI means most likely a comfortable zone that will make most likely humanity very lazy. Uh, I'm 100% sure many people here writing their resumes or whatever is in ChatGPT. Students are already on their like mindset. I am personally using a lot for emails. I mean, but it's very, I think, important time to go back to fundamentals. For example, the reason we work with the Yavanawa people in Amazonia, in we don't want to make it just a rainforest data set, just dumping like whatever ready data sets. I don't think they have any more meanings at all. They are cool, they will be functioning. Spend 200K, you have the stable diffuse, but what does it mean? Uh, I think this is a very important time for creative people. I hope that we will ask these questions deeper to really make the change. Um, otherwise, we become these <laughs> weird robots of machines that making the same thing over and over again. So, I mean, again, um, I think every project has a depth and a meaning, but I really hope that everyone working with AI and spending their time with these tools and machines and algorithms have the same sensitivity and depth that hopefully make the world much better. Thank you so much, Rafik. Thank you. <laughs> and maybe one, one question I wanted to just quickly ask you is, because obviously 
we talked about making the you know invisible visible, and that's <laughs> relevant in both of your practice. But I think at the same time, also thinking about your coral reef project, which goes in tandem with what you do with the glaciers, uh, it's not only a program about change, but it's also a catalyst to hopefully change things, no? to produce reality. Can you talk a little bit about that? How to go beyond making the invisible visible and actually change? Yes. Yeah, so another, I think, powerful, I think I'm very grateful for our journey because the more we got recognition and went to the spaces where in the world leaders are happening, like in Davos, I mean, if you've ever been in World Economic Forum, but it's a building in Davos, it's a very weird space with snipers and helicopters, like all the like world leaders in that one building, and they don't have assistance. They are like <laughs> 2,000 people. Like they, they don't know where to go the first day, by the way, because you know, they're used to their assistants and emails and things. But the building is so important. It's beyond just United Nations. In that building, like there's 55 um, very uh, powerful people has a power to change the world. And there we showed the Coral Dreams project, which was um, uh, also close a billion um, parameter, uh, fine-tuned model of um, coral data. And we focus on how we resurrect the uh, corals, which we are also you know, unfortunately losing. So we are trying to find last several projects using function for AI, not only just create beauty, beautiful, shiny, aesthetic pixels, but find a way to, on the other hand of the like coin, a function. And good news, uh, that research turned into a reality. A United Nations ocean preservation team and four countries allowing us to really 3D print those AI-made corals, put them underwater to try to rec resurrect the nature that we lost. So I think this ecosystem of artificial realities is becoming a much inspiring than at home, just interacting with ready tools. Thank you so much, Refik. Um, now I'd, we'd like to uh, bring in Cecil Tolas. I first heard Cecil's name, um, I think, 15 years ago through somebody whose opinion I highly uh, valued and uh, respected. And I was told that there was this incredible person that was not only cataloging um, smells that we might think are sort of grotesque or repugnant or unwanted, but that she had turned all of this into a kind of very singular practice that um, was ultimately revealing aspects of ourselves to ourselves that couldn't be done through any of the other senses that we think about. Several years later, um, because we both, um, I live in Berlin and so does Sissel, we got to know each other and it's been, um, and actually partly through, I guess the Museum of the Future uh, was uh, a, a number of um, uh, sort of workshops, uh, sort of brainstorming workshops that were organized by by Noah Rafford a number of years ago, um, brought us together. And uh, you know, ever since then, uh, I've had the privilege uh, to have also another kind of continuous conversation with, with Cecil and to see uh, her um, research, which is grounded in very hard um, science, chemistry uh, background, but then has um, morphed and evolved into uh, a practice that again, is completely singular um, and unreplicable, uh, I think, by anybody else, and has caught the attention of uh, Demna at Balenciaga, and so Cecil has become a, uh, a collaborator, part of the kind of inner network of the Balenciaga brand over the last few years, and she's had an incredible, uh, uh, I, I'm not going to, it, it's not a retrospective, but it's a, it's a, it's a using um, museum buildings such as in Oslo or in uh, Philadelphia to create these living organisms. Actually, I think living ecosystems, where um, the kind of currency of smell is explored um, in sort of multitudinous ways. So, um, Cecil, I would like to uh, invite you to tell our audience a little bit more uh, about what you do and about your worldview. Um, and if we could have Cecil's presentation up, that would be great. So, but first, can you join me in welcoming Cecil Tolas? Thank you.
Hello. Thank you very much for this kind introduction and for inviting me to this part of the world. Um, you have been in my home country, Iceland, which is also very exciting. And I want to know what happened when you walked on the ice and what did you smell and what happened with the shift of things. Anyway, I've been passionate about how the world would come across if we scale down. What happened if we start to understand the world in a different way using the other interfaces we are equipped with for free? We have a metabolism called the body, and there's a hardware and the, the senses called, you know, and then the software called the senses. And we live in a world that's driven by how things look like. Me, she, he, it uh, looks like. And if you start to look into other way of communication, the way that bacteria started off once upon a time on planet Earth through chemical communication, you would discover a dimension you didn't know existed. So since 20 years, I've been looking into this invisible reality, and nothing is more real than a smell. A smell can never lie. We live in a world where marketing took over with science left, and 25 years ago I said, I'm gonna trans make that change. And you cover up the world, we don't even know what is. That start with the body, that continue to the spaces we are surrounded in, and so on and so forth. We are living in a sanitized world that don't do good to either the body or the atmosphere or beyond. And COVID made that even, 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 even worse. So we are surrounded by these particles called smell molecules. We breathe up to 24,000 times a day, move 12,7 cubic meter air with our breathing. Air is shared endeavor. We all contribute to this, but we don't know what it can do with you, what it can contain, and what this information actually do to the body and the brain. Smelling, the process of smelling, is the quickest process in the body and in the brain. Two synapses, you activate emotion and memory. That's quite amazing. And if we have nothing else, we still can breathe, and the smell, inhaled by every breath we do, and it does something to us beyond our consciousness. So understanding what chemistry is in terms of chemical communication and various species is the essential to what I've been doing for 25 years. So these are the various journeys I've been doing. And if you provide the brain with any kind of information, it makes sense out of it. And put out a spell and you will be understanding that very setting beyond your imagination. And your tolerance toward it will also be challenged in a very interesting way. So micro macro reels is my topic of concern. Showing up is half my job. Being in the field, smelling it first myself is really what I do. I really show up. And this has happened across the globe. I'm from Norway, partly Iceland, and I started off on the West Coast, very curious about the elements, and what the senses, what kind of information, all the senses can provide me to understand the very context I am in, and the issues of concern in that very context. So, 2002, I got aware of an industry that had technology that potentially could enable me to go beyond what my own nose were able to do. So I took this technology out to reality. I brought it to Iceland, Greenland, and started to collect molecules emitting from snow melting in the middle of the field. And this is earth molecules and various other projects, micro macro level, ice melting, what happened with the, with the ice when it's melting, what does it reveal, and how can we understand and engage with the topic of concern in a different way. And I believe without emotional a reaction, there is no action in this world. And what smell specifically accomplished is to engage with one's emotions. And most of all, it adds back joy and playfulness to smelling reality. We think we so much know, but we don't know it because we only operate with surface of things. So here I'm in South Pacific trying to understand the ocean. And this is for you and a big archive of building up about climate change. This is the brown algae's invasion in the Mexico Gulf and the, it, you know, the, the methane thrown into the Mayan jungle. 
And this is the lab, extension of my lab, that do the analysis of my recordings. And these are the recordings. So I record invisible reality. In my case, the technology, the tech part is in the process, not in the product. Because what comes out on the other side is dependent of you. Everybody smells different. Everybody have a memory related to that smell that are different. And that is so important to know when we are communicating in this world. It's not just my way or no way or no. Norway or Iceland. <laughs> so this is my data. This can be, uh, you know, a complex smell. I take a smell source that for micro macro level and break it up into, in your case, pixel, in my case, molecules. So these molecules give clear indications of what is going on in this invisible world. And this is my laboratory consisting of 20,000 molecules. Literally, this is my alphabet, my pixels. And here are various projects where I've taken, you know, these issues to a very extreme, you know, looking into how can extinction be understood in beyond, beyond, you know, image and a text. So with the collaboration with multiple others, we were able to se sequence the DNA of extinct plants and grow the DNA and tissues developed and this tissue started to smell. I scanned the world for the molecules and made a situation where you put yourself on display smelling extinction of plants in nature. Not only is it about extinction in nature in this case, but also extinction of human emotions. So you put yourself on display in a diorama showing the lack of showing emotion or maybe the, the skill of showing emotions. So it's a double meaning. So this is the Bern National History Museum in, in Switzerland, and this is the Venice Biennale in, mm -hmm. of architecture la, last year in Venice. We have, we have some people from the audience sitting in the box. And uh, yes, again, forensic chemistry is what I do. And these are various projects where my knowledge has been taken serious and become something beyond uh, what I ever expected. So this is in Cochin in Kerala, where it was all about the, the, the legacy of Cochin. And I was curious about where are all the stones that were used to transport ships from Kerala to Europe. And I found multiple of these stones laying around in Cochin, brought them to High Tech Park in, Kerala, in, in Bangalore, and developed a technology that enabled me to smell the inside of the stones, literally smell the legacy of the stone. It's quite stunning. And this is then brought back to Cochin at the Biennale, and as part of the Anthropology Museum of Southern India as a permanent installation. And literally just the surrounding that surround us all the time, sometimes contain information beyond one's imagination. This is a recent project I'm doing now for UNESCO with the Nicoletta Ferrucci Foundation, a smell heritage archive for Pompeii, looking into what kind of information could be hiding in the ruins that we never ever thought would be there. So here I am in Pompeii, together with archeologists. And that's not only what I will potentially uh, discover when they reveal the strata of AD 79, but also the conversation with the archeologists and geologists, et cetera, on the side, like, oh, we never talked about, but, you know, smelling when we are revealing. We are always looking for something, but now, you know, we also potentially also could smell some, some, some other dimensions. So these are archives. And this is another uh, project I've been working on for many years, looking into the body. If we train our nose properly or our senses properly, can we one day be able to smell each other's state of mind? So this is a project started at MIT about fear and anxiousness and excitement. And I replicated body sweat from anxious men that are very scared of others for various reasons. The replicated nanotechnology embedded smell was placed on the wall, became invisible people. And the only way you could activate the person's smell was touching the wall. So these, these are, are invisible uh, graffitis of anxious men, and you're doing to them what they are afraid of. Again, raising questions about serious issues, and are moving image away, and just 
taking a person and the interaction between people. This is Singapore. Normally, you don't see Singaporeans like this next to each other. <laughs> we have a few in the front row. <laughs> And uh, this is a uh, Minsheng 21st Century Museum in, um, in Shanghai. This is the wall after three years of um, emotional re reaction and action. And it's another project, a meta molecule for Tanya Bruguera's commission at Hyundai. At the uh, what only purpose of the molecule was to make people cry. And people are still calling me and say, listen, give me the molecule. I want to start to cry properly again. <laughs> Again, recording, replication, reaction. So rec recording, replicating reality, taking it out of the comfort zone, starting to ask questions, showing it comp complicated uh, issues in, in a playful way is what I do. But how do I talk about that? Yeah, how do we talk about smell, which is the most complicated part of the whole issue with smell, because there is no language in most languages. So since long, I've been trying to look into, and my smell, it's smelling is also aerodynamic. It's air, without air, you have no sound. So for, for, for a long time, I've been looking into how can we potentially build up a lexicon around smell. So this is the Istanbul Biennale, where I, I laid out smells from the city, had scholars and people out in the field tracking and mapping the, the, the smells and trying to express something phonetically towards the smell. And long, long, long story short, I built up this, this massive archive. This is in Korea, South Korea, and the project has been going on for 25 years. And these are some of the outcomes that are then presented in various contexts where I show my work. So an attempt to talk about things in a different way beyond semantic and semiotic, the way we do it. How do we talk about chemistry? How do we talk about invisible, you know, beyond the, the conventional? So, this is a way of, 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 of approaching. And the latest part of this research has happened now with, the, with Oslo, uh, the museum in Oslo and the RCA, uh, ICA, where I develop a software. The purpose of the software is to record the motion in the voice the moment you smell something. So this is a new project, a new database, where AI is literally sorting these expressions up, and then here you have a wall of confession. You literally kneel down. Out of the wall come three abstract molecules that are simultaneously on display in Korea, Greenland, Norway, Iceland, uh, uh, it's, it's Korea, China, America. Uh, yeah, seven stations sharing the same database, smelling the same molecules, and it's stunning. So the sound of the voice, the moment you say something towards the smell, is what the software record. And this is quite stunning. I showed it in the Pens University of Pennsylvania, and I had linguists coming up to me and said, wow, this is the sound of emotion. This is the language of emotional intelligence. Mind-blowing. So I hope to take that project pretty far. And also one day maybe to, to embed it in the way we communicate certain issues. If we're talking about scaling down, we need to scale also the language we use to talk about things. So here is another, you know, not the variation of how smell can be embedded in the world we live in. A project I did with Lund University in 2000, where I looked into can an uh, abstract smell, when I speak of abstract smell, my laboratory have 20,000 abstract smells. Only by putting them together, they become concrete. It's like an alphabet. A without the B is, doesn't make sense. So all these abstract smells, I gave references. These are the molecules. These are the codes. These are the, these are the codes, content codes I gave to the molecule. This is 365 molecules, 365 references. So you smell, and then you listen to content. And we were testing how much do you remember after one year when, when this content is recalled by the same smell. Stunning. And all this I then apply. So this is my archive of 365 smell codes with different content. So this is the device that enable you to carry these memories with you around. And then you can use it for education. So this is 
a class I did around climate change for children to learn about issues in the world, but smelling the issues, engaging with the issues, using their emotion in a different way. This is in Syria and in Jordan. This is workshop, what does it mean to have a sense? And this is about tolerance in Detroit, and this is about disability in, in, in various parts of the world. And last but not least, to see how I put all this into a context. So these are museum I just the museum exhibition I just did in Oslo, Oslo Family Museum uh, during COVID. I coded my exhibition. That's all there is. There is no explanation. There is no who is Cecil, what did she study, who does she know, who does she not know, how much money does she earn, where, did, where is she from? Nothing. <laughs> this is a, literally a musical score combination with music score and chemical chem periodic table. So every legend have a meaning. Every legend have a group of research attitude, and the numbers in, the, in each legend refer to the years, the, the archives and the research started. The first thing I ask for is the air, the piping system. So what I did in the building, looking into the building as a, as a living matter, like biology, and I asked for the air and the piping of the museum, and I hacked the air condition. Mm -hmm. I laid out my work according to how the air was blown through the building. This is Astrofelny Museum in Oslo. This is me in, in the process of taking down the walls because I didn't know if COVID would allow me to go inside the museum. So the white wall inside became the, the outside wall, and inside, outside wall became the inside wall, turning everything upside down because the world was upside down at that time. So this is the outside. And this is like one of the richest countries in the world, world, in the world. In the world, you know, where shiny and is, is, the, is, is the way of you know, to communicating wealth. And I wanted to show the imperfection and the flaws underneath the shiny surfaces. And in Norway, we think this wall looks ugly in the outside, you know, because the weather did harm to it. But when it was put inside the museum, I said, wow, that's actually beautiful, yeah? So this is the white wall outside where the scary men are, um, are embedded on the wall. This is the piping system where I hacked the air condition all over. So you see, it's connecting the ocean to the inside. I pumped ocean water into the museum, into a sink, where you wash yourself with ocean water and you wash yourself with my self-portrait as a soap. So you add it on instead of moving away. And this was during COVID, so you actually, yeah, you are, you know, we all knew what cleaning was. So you stand in a circle, you added my smell, my self-portrait. So here you have adding on. Of course, it's salty water, and the salty water goes in the loop. Life and ocean and all this were here connected. This is my ticket, the smell of money become the ticket, uh, the ticket entrance. So I made a, a huge archive started with Swiss Franc in 2004, recording the, 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 the molecules emitting from various coins. And you buy your ticket, and you get one ticket, and you could use it, reuse it as many times as you want, as long as you smell for money. And you could share it with whoever you wanted endlessly. We had 30,000 people in four months. So this was my ticket, and this continued to, to ICA as well. So this is the money. And as an extension of that, I made a more complex smell of money as a sauna. Norway is an offshore oil country, so I made an offshore platform. And you enter the, uh, you could rent the sauna, went offshore, just around the corner from the museum. You went into the sauna, you sweat in money, you money launder in the ocean, <laughs> and you are offshore. Issues, and we, I had bankers lined up to launder the money. So all, so it was amazing. It was like on the spot. This museum is on the most expensive piece of real estate in the Northern Hemisphere. So it was like, look, these are wealthy guys. So 
Anyway, I'm taking the entire day here. Anyway, this is my codes. This is the only thing you saw in every exhibition space. So I had a forensic uh, um, scientist investigating into all the scars on the building. And with permission of Lorenzo Piano, I made a double hole on the wall to reveal the air piping. So here you have pi pipes revealing. People are up and down, back and forth, no rules. The scars on the floor become the starting point for conversation. Underneath the museum, there's the most important archaeological site in the north, and I bring up the stone from underneath the building, and and uh, just make you know where where are we is how we think and how we understand the world, and this is chemical communication in, in taking out molecules from underneath the building, all the way up in the sky, chemical communication between various species going continuously changing uh, using co microcomputers in, in doing this. Anyway, so I'm getting there. This is the, this is the, the table of empathy where a lot of uh, 20 different projects, and I call it emotional artifacts, uh, people's stories are recorded and pl placed into 3D objects. And you activate the object and you engage with people's story. It became the most incredible uh, moment. Also because of COVID, suddenly people could touch and share and smell as a trigger of people's story. It's not about my story, it's about everybody's story. So these are various sites from the museum, exhibition, and then I'm not gonna go to, into all the, all the details, but here, you have the last room at the museum, just before you go to the bathroom, before you leave, you have uh, uh, leaflets, you can reveal the codes, get some information about what the research has, is all about. Anyway, this is Balenciaga. I've been working with Balenciaga for the last five years, made smell for the European Parliament project, greed, greed, uh, and power, uh, these are various projects. This is about climate change and catastrophes. Uh, they're walking on water. And for all these uh, projects, smell is part of the storyboard, not just on the top of to illustrate what the vision cannot do. Without the smell, the experience wouldn't be the, be the same. And what people remember from these shows is the smell mostly. So this is the winter, this is the during COVID, we made a VR where I made a letter embedded with a nano smell of Christopher Balenciaga basement in Baskinlon. You open the VR set and you smell a basement of rotten fish. So it was stunning. And then all these VIPs who got this box like, oh, Balenciaga, that's not the smell we suspected you to make. I said, no, but there is a message in my bottle. It's not just about the bottle. So, and this is the Wall Street I made again, used the smell archive for to be applied for the Wall Street show that Balenciaga did in Wall Street last year. And this is the Santiago Serra uh, landscape of, of, of earth, soil, which had no smell. So we, they were desperate, like, but how can, we have soil that don't smell because you cannot bring sterilized soil, uh, you know, not sterilized soil into a building. So I added on the smell of earth. Anyway, here we go into the research phase, collecting molecules from various sites in Balenciaga and then uh, in, the garm in, the, in the archives, a micro macro level of somebody's life. Again, applying what I've done for 25 years to real stuff, and this is the recordings, this is the headquarter in Paris, and all the shops in the world will have some of these archive smells embedded from 1st of April. And this, I made a candle, 500 euro candle, in case somebody <laughs> will like. Yeah, and, and again, you know, in that candle, that's hardcore reality. It's tobacco, it's smoke, it's sewing machines, it's fish, it's all kind of amazing traces from somebody's life. So this is uh, my, um, but I need to send you. And please don't take this the wrong way. You smell like expensive wood. <laughs> What is that? It's, it's, that? That is the most unique compliment I've ever oh, gotten. It's, That's it's what good. that is. And believe me, it's very good. It, I, I, I've, never, I've never had a little of that before. It's just, it's a very, very subtle... Anyway.
If we can place our messages in that kind of context, maybe the mission can be accomplished. And with engaging with people's emotion, be sure, never forget. My, I hope my passion is at least contagious. Oh, it's a, a, a phenomenal uh, education in the, work, the universe of Cecil Tollas. It was uh, kind of breathtaking, and it's so wonderful to see both of your uh, researchers together. I, we've got about 10 minutes all together. If there are going to be any questions, um, do put your hands up, wait for the microphone. But I, I think Hans Ulrich and I really wanted to ask about this um, very misunderstood term, uh, and I mentioned it in the introduction, which is artificial intelligence. And um, the, there's, a, there's a piece by the um, science fiction writer called Ted Chang. I'm sure many of you know him. And he published a piece in The New Yorker uh, last week, actually, which is called Chat GPT, Chat GPT is a blurry JPEG of the web. It's one of the best uh, pieces I've read. Uh, interestingly, like yourselves, Ted comes from a technical background and actually spent 20 years uh, in parallel of becoming a science fiction writer, writing technical manuals for Boeing and, and, and Microsoft, et cetera. And so the way in which Ted um, approaches a subject is surgical. You know, there's something methodical, robust, cumulative, um, but his, he has, I think, a really legitimate critique of these large language model AIs. We can't put all AI models into the same category, but ChatGPT is, an, uh, is the latest and perhaps the best well-known uh, example of a large language model, which relies on, of course, in a sense, uh, you know, the entirety of the internet up till fall 2021, I believe. But it is what is... Um, understood as information there, it's text, right? It's, it's a sort of text-based, language-based um, idea of, uh, of, our, of the entirety of our knowledge or of civilization or who we are, et cetera, et cetera. And Cecil, you know, what you do, I think, is remind us that that is just one very small fragment of really what we consider to be what we should consider to be the totality of information, the totality of our history. And I'm, I'm curious to imagine, you know, what could there be an AI that would be built on smell rather than, let's say, large language model? What would that be? You know, you know I, I tend to defend the sense of smell as a, from the perspective of, of all kind of animals. You know, mm -hmm. humans are the last one in the road of skilled animals to identify smell. Elephants is my favorite 2,500 receptor dog, one, 900 bees, 1,005 humans, 400. Yeah? And, you know, the sense of smell is very complex. Like you saw in some of my recordings, it's just a micro level of the molecule out there that I'm able to to grasp you know also because the technology technology existing technology has never really been interested in understanding what I'm doing yeah they are rather been uh, interested in covering up what they don't know you know so so I think it's uh, and also not only being able to record you know what I record correspond to my database yeah and my database in this case are 20,000 molecules. So recording, a replication is dependent on each other. But there are trillions and billions of molecules out there. So whatever, how do we make sense of this? We have to start somewhere, you know? That's what I'm, I'm you know, in terms of scaling, I think it's here very important to, we need to, to uh, we need to kind of make the, 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 the need, we, we get the need out there to look into how to do this in a different way and why, you know? And uh, yeah, the purposes has to be right so that we get enough, you know, interest to be able to do this properly and then maybe one day, you know, but there are, I mean, I did my talk at MIT in 2004 with the FAIR project. I was approached by CIA if I could help them smell a terrorist by their smell. <laughs> and now, yeah, I tell you, they offered me fortune. And, 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 and I hope uh, you said yes, huh? secretly. But I, of course not. <laughs> I 
but not like DARPA. Silence. DARPA is doing that, you know. They, I mean, that's how they get these ideas, you know. MIT is sponsored by the army, so anyway. But anyway, I think it's, it's, it's a long way. I think I paved the way 25 years working with the industry, trying to challenge the existing knowledge for other purposes. But again, bringing this technology out in the dirty street, in the garbage depot, you know, has been a massive, you know, movement. Mm -hmm. You know, you have electronic nodes that are used by NASA, you have all these kind of tools, but they are specifically for target, you know, molecules in, in situation where you normally cannot put, uh, you know, on your nose, yeah? And could, I'd like to ask Refik, um, I mean, could you tell us, you've, again, been working, obviously, with AI for many, many years, but what, as I say, what we think of now popularly as AI is really a very narrow uh, definition. So could you tell us about, you know, alternative possibilities of AIs that we don't know about? So far. Yes. By the way, for everyone, if you're interested of the journey, I have a literally talk in one and a half hour at Museum of the Future. I will dive into the more details. But what is incredibly inspiring is with Cecil's research because she is collecting her own data, and which is fascinating. I've been working last three years with Fermanich, which is well known, probably the most largest scent and taste company who is behind all the famous perfumes. And they have an AI called Charlie trained on half million molecules, which is not bad. I mean, you, you have 20,000 for over the years, and they work with this. But what was interesting is the context, right? Because you are bringing this context and the reasoning through this research. You're curiosity and motivation but when you oh, sorry, I just correct you the, the, the amount of molecules I'm recording is billions yeah but, yeah, but they, 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 they train on half million only that they are proud to yeah. work and the, wha what is interesting is this AI is left over I mean has been trained for three years and all these you know famous companies that we know very well most likely using the perfumes they found it boring because it didn't like follow the guidelines of the you know brands and that world and then this AI is very weirdly doing nothing and then we start like work with it. It's basically a recognition of like images and it can come up with like very some image recognition text basically. Let's say it's watching the Iceland or some kind of AI dreaming landscapes or you know glaciers and it can come up up to 34 molecules which is already enough to create a kind of a sand but it doesn't know what is a value and it can create very expensive molecules which you cannot use in the life. So this is a really interesting topic. I've been like last three years researching and respectful. That's why I was so fascinated by the how incredible data set of sand. Um, anyway, uh, but shortly, I think AI right now is only focused on like products and services, right? Everyone is trying to make an unfortunately quick way of like making it accessible with the goodwill, but then turns into like product and service. And I mean, image to sound, sound. To, I mean, image to text, text to image, and most likely, you know, sound may come, t sand may come, taste may come. I, I think it's just an inspiring time. It's like witnessing the birth of internet. Um, it's not so different. Maybe, I don't know your age, but I mean, hearing the like... I'm just curious. You talked about shift. Yeah. What do you mean? The shift of like... Now, when you walked on the ice compared to sitting in the studio looking yeah. at the I mean, so phys what physical impact will that have on your next step? You physical think? quality of life, like retina experience. I mean, it's, by the way, it's 100% sure that the future is all about real, what is real or what is not, right? I mean, pretty much all about like, which will make the most real thing ever, but that kind of a race. Uh, yeah, I'm curious because they're having the same conversation with the archeologist in Pompeii. So they are like, digging, digging, revealing, you know, from the traces, st strata, strata, looking for things. And when I said, listen, with the moment you start to smell what you're revealing, does something change? Hundred percent. Or just like a, a like a Newton apple falling on the head, like why? Wow, we never thought about this. Absolutely. Before. All the senses in the moment discovering the past. What consequence will that? Will we write the protocol differently? Would t would the history look differently? You know, well, who's telling whose story here? You know, I think this is a lot of what what this is all about. Beyond semantics, semiotic, what kind of story, what kind of language, what kind of coding, what kind of system of communication we're talking about? If we are talking about data, big scale, even in the world of, of small molecules. But I think the whole idea of Louis Borghesian sort of light library of Babel, like one day, hopefully, or everything we are preserving like life right now, like can it be a space where every single human without any borders and barriers or usernames or whatever's or Web3 logins, you have an access to go through this door and you have everything that exists. I think that sounds sci-fi, but I am 100% sure it's doable. It's a collective research. But also very interesting is like, I don't know how realistic this is from now on, but I think creating a collective memory for humanity is a really powerful idea. 
And at the moment, if you think about like 10,000 years later, when they excavate this building, most likely they will find these weird, like boring, dark, dark machines, right? What we do with them, which is our traces, are not anymore traceable. So our usernames and identities and Web3 logins are exactly the reason most likely our history will not be recorded as we imagine. Most likely 10,000 years ago, when uh, you know, excavating are bringing more information than most likely who we are. I mean, this is a fascinating topic to think. Yeah, and that leads us to <clears throat> something which I think is really relevant, which is in order to give justice to your work, right, I think we need towards the end of this panel to go beyond the exhibitions. Because I think what, you know, when Schumann had this idea of bringing you both here together, of course AI is a common ground. But I think another thing which is common ground between the two practices has to do with long durée, as Fernand Brodel says. It has to do with long duration. And I think we live at the cusp of, some, of a moment where we need to go beyond event culture. Roman Kajanik says, you know, we need to liberate the world from short-termism. And that means we need to look into longer durational formats. And it's not a coincidence that at the moment, artists are more interested in doing gardens, literally and metaphorically. I mean, we did at the Serpentine this AI garden with Alexander Daisy Ginsburg. We worked with you, Sissel, on a project where you also developed ideas for the park, which we hopefully can develop on a longer you know, duration level. And the same thing is very much true for you, Rafik. You, both of you have also architectural projects which go beyond exhibitions. So I think it would be very interesting to hear a little bit more about that, about your practice beyond the exhibition, how you work, for example. I mean, Cecil, you've just done this amazing thing at the IC Day in Philadelphia, where you literally deal with the idea of a building. And I think public art is going to become more important again, because public art is not event culture. Public art is always there. It can be there for a long time. And I think particularly with technology, it's really, really interesting if you think about <coughs> the work being a living organism. You know, I kind of grew up in Zurich, and I would always every week be at the railway station and see this Mario Merz piece you know, as a kind of a commission. And it never really changed. It's still there, which is great, but it never changed. So I'm, I've often been thinking of you know, what would happen if we had actually public art, which would change. And with both of your work, where the artwork is a living organism, I think it's predestined to be the public art of the future. And I think it would be great towards the end of the panel to both hear you speak about that and maybe about some of the projects you do with architecture, with gardens, with parks, with urbanism, beyond the format of the exhibition, realized and also maybe dreams. Things, because I think it's always interesting to to hear artists also talk about unrealized projects because we then can help to make them happen. So yeah, it's a long question, but it would be great to both hear you about that. You know, I'm, in my case, you know, all my work is somehow uh, taking place in reality and trying to amplify what is or, you know, to to decontextualize reality, and, and I've done a lot out, uh, you know, in the, in the free, in open, also what I'm doing in Pompeii is going to be something like this, you know, the area where we are doing excavation that are becoming accessible um, for the audience, you know, in the, in the context of the ruins. Yes, I mean, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know what to say because I, I, I work in between, you know, I never really seen myself a kind of artist, artist. I call myself a professional in between because there is smell everywhere and all the time. And, you know, any, any topic in the world can be looked upon from the perspective of smell. So, you know, education is one thing. I do a lot and I do a lot in scientific research. I work, you know, commercially. So, you know, it's exhibition is just one little part you know, of what I do. So uh, that's how I will define me contributing and, and placing, placing my knowledge, you know, in a bigger context. And, also potentially, you know, contributing to change. And also the fact that I tried during COVID to change the museum, ICA and Astro Ferli in Oslo, you know, with two amazing women who also had, I was their guinea pig and we were each other guinea pig. And I said, listen, I don't want any text on the wall. I want to, you know, chemistry to do the talking. Give me access to your air condition. Can we take down walls? You know, can we let people find a way without telling them what to do? That's already, and leaving the museum of that kind of exhibition or that kind of experience, you suddenly start to behave differently, you know? So taking down walls, understanding that buildings, even if there's no human, there's still air. The biggest host of building is air, and the air is shared endeavor. So, you know, making people aware of this, telling stories, your story, the taxi driver's story is as important as me telling my 
25 years of passion, you know, like making that kind of uh, behavior accessible, you know, in the classroom, in the corporation, like caring and uh, balance yoga and, and beyond, you know, I think, you know, can have impact and yes. does have impact. I love this idea that you know, exhibitions are only a little part of it and then when you do exhibition to change the rules of the game. And but also what is, I think, wanted to say here is the, the adding joy and playfulness to the, to, to the, to the, is the topic of concern, changing the, the kind of rhetoric, I think is essential to get things done. Also with emotional reaction, there's no action, you know, like that's how we start life. Learning in the context, using the senses and emotion that stay with you forever, you know. And that connects a lot to you, Rafik, because also exhibitions are only a little part that you basically go into landmark buildings, you know, with UNESCO, you have the amazing work. You know, we mentioned Gaudi before as an uh, infinite architecture, the Sagrada Familia. You have actually worked with a Gaudi building. Can you talk a little bit about those projects? Yes, the Gaudi building was a, I mean, one of the most pandemic projects, unfortunately, didn't start properly, but then turned into a 50,000 people celebration of the building, uh, which LiDAR scanning of like 1 billion points of the UNESCO heritage quality of data sets. But I want to say like it is the Impossible Projects, it's a very exciting day. This book, The Incredible Journey of Plants by Stefano Mancuso, um, because I mean, things have been done is exciting, but things that hopefully one day can happen. So Stefano Mancuso is a, a neuro neurobiologist, uh, which is a leading mind who is like, like practicing and computing data from the plants, and he is measuring the life inside the trees. And so, and this book just came from Mikola this morning. Very funny because I've been deeply researching the idea of like making invisible visible through these these plants, and I've been heavily inspired last several times in Amazonia Acre with one of my friends. In so I just want to dive into the nature, like not in a surface, but really with the jaguar sounds and the snakes, and like going deep to this life in a way that when we just don't have this biased world and the things we construct around us and going back to fundamentals are bringing a massive inspiration so i hope for everyone if you have a moment to like go back to fundamentals i highly believe the life is more resourceful when you come back to what we have here so this book is amazing i hope you can enjoy and, and deep dive into the invisible world of plants very last question i know we are out of time and we promise that this will not be a marathon However, um, I see a lot of young artists here also, and I thought it would be kind of, given your immense experience, be exciting uh, to kind of hear your kind of answer to the Rainer Maria Rilke question. You know, he wrote this beautiful little book, which is advice to a young poet. What would you both advise a young artist and art student? Discovery is what you do when you don't know what you're doing. I think the best way of um, going through the deep journey is recognizing the shoulders of the giants we are all on. I mean, the more we have heroes and mentors and teachers, the more we recognize them, the more what we do makes more meaningful and purposeful. And the second thing, defining success was very helpful for me. Like, to me, success is super simple to define making dreams real. And I think this helps us in a very mental health space, much, you know, confident bef before like bringing, try to get values or whatever and other things that has barely have meaning in the long run. But in the short run, feeling connected with the work, I found these two things powerful, and I hope you can also enjoy your mentors and their support in your journey. And I think it's also very important, this the issue of confidence. I think if we somehow accomplish to bring back confidence to all mankind, the world will be better. And that's very much to do with, to, to kind of, you know, appreciate that, you know, um, the fact that we are all are equipped with the same, starting point you know the body and the senses all there for free we just need to activate it for the right purpose and not only look at the things and think we understand so starting to look into one skill as a toucher as a smeller as a hearer as a taster and start to make those topics important put them on the dinner table smell the dinner rather than eat it Smell each other and ask questions. What did you do last night? Why didn't I know this? From a different, you know. And it just changed the mood. And it changed the same with, with climate change, with inequality. That's what I do with the smell like new wood. Yes, he was smelling like rotten wood, but on that person and smell like new wood. So, you know, change perspective and play with the senses because the senses are meant to be played with and understanding the world using the senses add back joy and playfulness. Thank you.
we have come to the end of day one of this Global Art Forum. Um, I hope you agree with me. It's been a really extraordinary journey through uh, ideas, through kind of imagination. Um, and really the last thing I'd like to ask you all to do is to please thank um, our amazing guests, Cecil Tolas, Refik Anadol, and also Hans Ulrich Obris. Thank you so much.